one, go. All right, amen. Uh, welcome back to True Gospel Radio. I'm your host, Brother Dakota, once again. And we're doing another video with uh, Brother Zachary. Hey. And in this video, we're going to talk more about the atonement and specifically Colossians chapter 2, verse uh, verses 13 to 15. And uh, refuting penal substitution, because this is a, a really huge verse that they use to try to say that Jesus paid uh, a sin debt. And so we're going to um, explain this passage from two different perspectives. Um, so Zachary, he's going to um, explain his uh, perspective, and then I'm going to um, give kind of another perspective on it that is a little bit different, but it ties in. And so, um, yeah, why don't you start out? Sure. Amen. So I've been juggling this idea and we've been discussing this, our third video in a series on moral government atonement versus penal substitution. And I heard a debate, an atonement debate between Matt Slick of CARM.org. It's a Calvinist ministry for apologetics and uh, Jesse Morell of openairoutreach.com. And they had an atonement debate and Matt Slick was staunch that Colossians 2.14 proved his theology of penal substitution. He was convinced that if you could unconvince Matt Slick of any verse in the Bible about penal substitution, that there was one verse you could not convince him does not teach penal substitution, and that would be Colossians 2.14. He believes Colossians 2.14 is the absolute go-to penal substitution verse in the Bible and uh, so I've been writing a book against penal substitution atonement, and I felt that, of course, I had to address this verse. And when I first heard Matt's view on it, I was a bit stumped because I had never heard that argument about it. And so I want to share really quick with how the Reformed Christian, the penal substitutionist, views this verse, and then how I think the non-Reformed Christian or the non-penal substitution person can view this verse. So in Colossians 2.14, it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So speaking on the work of Jesus on the cross, that on the cross, Jesus nailed this handwriting of ordinances to the cross. Matt Slick's view is that this handwriting of ordinances was our certificate of legal sin debt, and that when Jesus was dying on the cross and Jesus said, it is finished, that that word, it is finished, means tetelestai, and that means paid in full, or can mean paid in full, or it is complete, or it is finished, like the King James author's example, for example, interpreted it. They didn't say it, it's paid in full, but that's a way you could look at it. And so Matt Slick's view is that legal sin debt was transferred to Jesus. And then when Jesus said it was finished, the atoning work of Christ was finished for the elect. And he took the wrath of God at that point sufficiently for the elect or the unconditionally pre-saved. And then therefore, uh, our legal sin debt is nailed to the tree and it is finished. And Jesus paid the fullness of our legal sin debt, Ted uh, That's Matt Slick's view of Charygraphon in the Greek there in Colossians 2, handwriting of ordinances, and it is finished at the Lestai in the Greek uh, when Jesus said that. Now, I don't think that handwriting of ordinances means legal sin debt, like Matt Slick says it does, nor do I believe that Tetelestai was meaning it is finished with reference to what Matt Slick thought it was in reference to, or what Reformed authors think it's referencing. So, uh, but this is a verse, I think if we're going to have a series on the atonement, refuting penal substitution, uh, me and you, Brother Dakota, we've got to look at this verse uh, and give an answer for it from our perspective. So, um, my view on Colossians 2.14 is pretty simple. We'll just be, be in two different, three different places in scripture and it'll be brief. Uh, but the word that the Reformed person, like I said, they focus on is handwriting of ordinances, which is charygraphon in the Greek which is a neuter compound of two words, which ends up meaning uh, to grave, to scrape, to scratch, uh, to engrave, to write down, or to record. And uh, that is uh, choreographon in Colossians 2.14 is thus right, rightly translated handwriting, handwriting. 
So that makes total sense. The term choreographon is used to denote a legal document at times or an important document such as a bond or a note of deposited, uh, such as a, let me catch here, such as a bond or a note of hand which acknowledges that money has either been deposited with him or lent to him who wrote the legal bond or letter. The word choreographon only occurs in this one place in the entire Bible in Colossians 2.14. The argument those who believe penal substitution will make is that this verse is talking about our legal note of debt being transferred to Christ, and he bore and paid for our legal sin debt on the cross by taking our sin debt literally into himself, as we discussed last week, by misapplying 1 Peter 2.24. They believe our li literal sins are put into the body of Jesus, making Jesus an object of God's wrath. And when Jesus took our legal sin debt and sins into himself on the cross, on the tree, and died for them, then he paid our sin debt. And they equate our sin debt with this handwriting of ordinances word. A point they will make is that Jesus taught us in Matthew 6, 12 to pray, Father, forgive us our debts. But then in Luke eleven four, 4, Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our sins. The penal substitutionist will make the point that Jesus equates sin and debt together, thus sin debt was transferred into and bore in his actual body on the tree by applying 1 Peter 2.24. Is this a proper rendering of these verses? In my personal opinion, I believe that those who appeal to Colossians 2.14 uh, to say that our sin debt was canceled at the cross are completely missing the point of the verse and are misusing it to defend their penal view at the neglect of the context around the verse. The big question is, what are the ordinances that were taken out of the way and nailed to the cross? This is important, Brother Dakota, and this is what a lot of people make the mistake of doing. Note the verse in Colossians 2.14 does not say Jesus took the handwriting out of the way and nailed it to his cross. Jesus took the handwriting of what and nailed it to the cross? Ordinances. So what are the ordinances, which were written by hand, which were an important document, that Jesus nailed to the tree? It wasn't the handwriting that was nailed to the tree, the important document, but it was the ordinances, the important document represented the principles that were nailed to the tree. And so that's important to understand what are the ordinances. Uh, that seems to be something the penal substitutionists will never ask. Um, context will teach us what Paul is referencing, whether he is meaning our legal sin debt or something else. Look at verse 216 of Colossians 2, if you turn your Bibles. It says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of new moons, or of the Sabbath days. And continues on to verse 20 and 22. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ, Colossians 2, from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to, there it is again, why are you subject to ordinances? He states ordinances again, same word. Let's see what he says. What are the ordinances? Verse 21, Colossians 2, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. The handwriting of ordinances, Paul's very plain. Paul doesn't try to trick you about what these handwriting of ordinances are, but the penal substitutionist, the Reformed theologian, makes it look like it's a mystery and we can't understand it. When Paul says literally six or seven verses later what the ordinances are that he just spoke of a few verses ago that Jesus nailed to the tree. Let's see here. The touch not, the taste not, handle not. According to context, Paul had in mind the idea of meat, drink, respect of a holy day, new moons, and Sabbath days, with the idea of touch not, taste not, handle not. Why would Paul be bringing up the point that Jesus had to remove the meat, drink, respect of holy day, new moon, Sabbath days, um, Sabbath day ideas? Because Paul's big point in a lot of his writing, right? is the mystery of Christ. And this mystery was hidden from ages, but revealed in these last times. And Paul was given this mystery to preach. What is the mystery Paul came to preach? Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. Christ and the church, Ephesians 5.32. 
The mystery to which Paul often references is the idea that Jews and Gentiles would be brought together into one body in Christ. That's the big point of a lot of Paul's writings. That's the big mystery oftentimes that Paul mentions. The mystery revealed would be that Christ is the fullness, the head of the body, and the body is the church made up of the faithful brethren in Christ, Colossians 1-2, and the faithful in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1-1. Paul's big point in much of what he writes about is that Jews and Gentiles have become one as they are in Christ together. This is Paul's point in Romans 9, which the Reformed theologian, the penal substitutionist, misunderstands. Ephesians 1, which they always misunderstand. And again here in Colossians 2. All three of these chapters, Romans 9, Ephesians 1, Colossians 2, reformed thinkers have resorted to in order to defend their sordid doctrines like limited atonement, unconditional election, or perseverance of the saints. Reformed thinkers are always misusing Paul's teachings to their own destruction, just as Peter said some would do, 2 Peter 3.16. What separated the Jews from the Gentile world? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. Meat, drink, respect of a holy day, new moons, and Sabbath day traditions which is what Paul mentions in Colossians 2 is the ordinances. What caused problems in the early church in keeping Gentiles and Jews from working together in the body? Oftentimes, it was dietary laws that separated them in the church and caused divisions, such as 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13, 1 Corinthians 10, 28, and Acts 15, 29. Food and dietary habits had become such an issue in Galatia, for example, that Paul had to oppose Peter to his face because Peter had left off eating with the Gentiles when the Jews walked in. And Peter had caused a division in the Galatian church by eating with the Jews when they were around Jew in, a, in a Jewish way, but then eating with the Gentiles in a Gentile way when the Gentiles were around and trying to still maintain this Jewish salvation and this Gentile salvation. And by doing that was causing division in the bride of Christ. A division had come into the church and Paul opposed Peter because he was to be blamed, Galatians 2.11, blamed for causing a division in the church by implying to the Gentiles that they had to keep the dietary laws of the Jews. This goes back to why the Jerusalem Council was enacted in Acts chapter 15. Judaizers had been following Paul everywhere Paul went preaching, and they, Judaizers, preached after Paul that unless the Gentiles keep the law of Moses, then they could not be saved. Acts 15, 1, Galatians 5, 3. What was obligatory on a Gentile who had become a Christian? That was the question. Many Jews had struggled to let go of their touch-not, taste-not, handle-not mindset and after a while left off the simplicity of the gospel to go back to the ordinances, mind you, of the law that had respect to meat, drink, respect of a holy day, new moons, and Sabbath days, they began to impose their Jewish convictions upon the new Gentile converts. This was causing a division in the church where you now had Jewish Christians and a Jewish salvation, and you had the Gentile Christians and a Gentile salvation, which is not what Jesus came to do. He came to make one body, one bride, made up of Jew and Gentile, of every tribe, tongue, and nation. Paul was grieved by this division and often addressed it in his writings to the churches, which were often made up of a mix of what? Both Jews and Gentiles. It is important to Paul to communicate to the Jews that they ought not impose these ideas of ordinances of men like food, drink, respect of a holy day, new moons, and Sabbath days upon the Gentiles. In other words, Gentiles did not need to become Jews in order to become Christians. And it was also important for Paul to communicate to the Gentiles to not do things that offended their Jewish brothers. For example, you can read 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13. Paul states in Romans 14, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteems anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if your brother be grieved with your meat, now you no longer walk charitably. Destroy not him with your meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God, listen to this, brother, 
Dakota. The kingdom of God is not in what? The meat kingdom drink. of God is not in meat. For destroy my brother for whom Christ died. For the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink, but in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat, destroy not the work of God. Could Paul be any more plain? All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for a man who eats with offense. Don't destroy the kingdom of God for the ordinances of touch not, taste not, handle not. If that is your convictions, that's great, but don't impose that on your brother. And Gentiles, don't eat things that intentionally offend your Jewish brethren. We both got to make some sacrifices here in order to be one in the church and, and, and our individual convictions or the lack thereof being a Gentile. Paul wanted the Jews to see that they as Christians had been made one with their Gentile brothers who were becoming Christians. The Jews needed to see that the handwriting of ordinances was blotted out, that they might see that Christ had, Ephesians 2, broken down the middle wall of partition between them, between Jews and Gentiles, as the Bible says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Here it is again. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man. So making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached peace to you, which were far off and to them, which were near. For through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father, Ephesians 2, 13 to 18. You might as well take the Apostle Paul of Colossians 2 and take the same Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2 and put those scriptures on top of each other. And you have the exact same Paul the Apostle making the exact same point. That Jesus, by dying on the cross, he becomes the way by which we are made one. He is our salvation. He is the path of salvation. He is the gate. He is the door of the sheep. It's by him we enter in, not through the commandments contained in ordinances. And so the Jews were really struggling with letting that go. And the Gentiles were struggling with the Jewish convictions being placed on them and not knowing what do I need to be, do to be a Christian. And Paul was making them see it's by the cross that this enmity between a Jew and a Gentile has been done away with. That's the enmity. And Paul says the exact same thing in Ephesians 2.15 as he says in Colossians 2.14, that the commandments of ordinances has been moved out of the way, blotting it out through his death on the cross. Compare Colossians 2.3 with Ephesians 2.3, and you will see many stark similarities. Paul's point in addressing the Jew-Gentile division in the church was to get them both to see the mystery, which is Christ in you, Christ in the Jewish believer and Christ in the Gentile believer that they together would understand that they are fellow citizens with the saints and are together built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, not the ordinances, that they are together being fitly framed together as a holy temple in the, in the Lord, being made together a habitation of God through the Spirit, Ephesians 2, 20 to 22. The handwriting of ordinances, I argue as I close, that was against us, which was contrary to us, as Paul said, are those very principles which Paul mentions in the following verses in Colossians 2.16 and Colossians 2.20-22. 2, I would like you to note that Paul uses the word us, that these ordinances were against us. Who is the us? The us is the faithful in Christ Jesus, which are at Colossae, Colossians 1 verse 2. Who are these faithful made up of? Jews and Gentiles both. These ordinances which Christ took out of the way, having fulfilled the law himself, were nailed to the cross. Yet as we read the New Testament, we can't help but tell that many Jews were not getting that important point. Therefore, many division, divisions continuously sprung up in what God was trying to do, make one new man, according to Ephesians 2.15. It is not the moral law which Paul is speaking of in Colossians 2.14, which has been done away with, else nobody today could sin, 
For where there is no law, there's no sin, Paul said in Romans 4.15. Neither is handwriting our legal sin debt, as that is not what the verse says. Neither does context support that conclusion. Paul goes on to urge that Colossian believers, who are both Jews and Gentiles, that they should put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness and humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body. Colossians 3, 10 through 15. The Colossians who had been saved, whether they were Jews or Gentiles, also needed to see that the middle wall of partition had been broken down between them, that the handwriting of ordinances which separated them had been nailed to the cross. Colossians 2.14, therefore, has nothing to do with our sin debt being nailed to the cross, therefore unconditionally saving all those for whom Jesus nailed the debt to. The new covenant had come. Gentiles did not need to become Jewish in their practices to be saved by Christ. This is Paul's point in mentioning that the handwriting of ordinances had been nailed to the cross, which was contrary to this mission of joining Jew and Gentile into one body, so making peace which was God's mission in Jesus Christ. Which was contrary to this mission of joining us together. Kerygraphon simply means something written by hand. A written document. The written document of ordinances were nailed to the cross in the principal sense. Ordinances being what Paul mentions in Colossians 2.16 and 20-22. to It can mean a legal document denoting a debt or receipt of payment, but does not have to mean that, which is the fault of many in reform circles who misuse this verse to their own destruction. So my conclusion is the ordinances, the handwriting of ordinances that Jesus nailed to the cross through the sacrifice of his body on the tree and making atonement was the ordinances which separated Jew from Gentile, which were contrary to us, the us being Jew and Gentile, and removing the enmity between us, who's the us, the Jew and the Gentile in the church. And Jesus' mission in doing this was to create a, of two groups, one new man, so making peace. And that was part of his goal and mission, of course, of course, in making atonement. And I think this is very unfortunate that the Calvinist completely misses that and just, just totally doesn't even acknowledge the context such as verse 16, verse 20 to 22. Read on into Colossians chapter 3. Look at the Ephesians and Romans 14. How countless parts of Paul's writings support my conclusion, whereas no other part of Scripture concludes the idea that sin debt was placed in Jesus' body. Nowhere. That they even conclude, see, they think this verse defends their position because Kerygraphon only occurs here in this one part of Scripture. And they think that just makes it a mystical mystery verse for Reformed thinking. But you would think if their entire theological system related to the atonement was built on one Bible verse, that that should be questioned, especially when Paul mentions the mission of Jesus was something way different from that in many other parts of Scripture. So uh, I don't think Colossians 2.14 is, when it mentions handwriting of ordinances, means sin debt. I think it means the ordinances of touch, not taste, not handle, not, like Paul says in context just a few verses later. Amen, brother. As well said. Um, also, just to back up what you're saying, um, it says the exact same thing in um, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10. It talks about how... Um, the old covenant and all the, the old covenant um, sacrifices, the tabernacle, um, all these different things were a shadow of uh, Christ that was to come as the Amen. ultimate sacrifice. Right. And then it, it says in verse uh, 10, it says, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances, 
imposed on them until the time of reformation oh look at that brother the time of reformation and we're refuting the reformers right now we're refuting yeah. the reformed theologians with the reformation bible verse isn't that beautiful hebrews yeah. 9 10 yes amen that that defends that view yeah another thing uh just real quick without getting uh too much into this because i know we've talked about it before but um it's worth mentioning again if our sin debt was paid, um, unless you believe in limited atonement where the sin debt was only paid for the elect, if you believe in um, uh, that Jesus died for all, which that's clearly what the Bible teaches, 1 John 2, 2, uh, you know, he, he is a propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Uh, John three sixteen, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Um, and so if, if Jesus paid a, a sin debt and it's already been paid for at the cross, then everyone is already forgiven. Everyone's already saved. Well, but it exactly. says in, if, yeah. you don't, if you don't have a debt, you cannot be charged as guilty. You cannot be charged as owing anything. That's why I can't understand why the penal substitutionists cannot understand the conclusions of their own position. If, if unbelief is a sin and the debt of sin, of the debt of the sin of unbelief has been nailed to the cross with Christ when he died, mm. then I have no debt I owe to God in my unbelief. Yeah. So even if I stay in unbelief, I am still saved on the principle that my debt of unbelief was paid for or nailed to the tree when Jesus died. It renders faith unnecessary for salvation. So mm -hmm. penal substitution, in my view, denies the necessity of faith. Yeah. And, you know, I was thinking about that earlier this week and, uh, the Bible clearly says um, that that unbelief in itself is a sin. In uh, John 16, verse 8 through 11, it says that the Holy Spirit will come. He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And then it says the next verse of sin because they believe not on me. Jesus was literally saying there that the sin of unbelief is one of the worst sins there is. You know, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 17 to 19, Paul also makes the relationship that unbelief is a sin, that the uh, Israelites did in the wilderness, and that's why they weren't, didn't inherit the promised land. So, you know, again, if you're an elect person and Jesus paid for your sin debt, unconditionally saving you and blotting out your, your obligations to God, then whether I believe it or not, my debt is still paid. That's why I've had people in the streets when we've been open air preaching or witnessing the people in the streets. I've had sinners going into bars saying, whether I ever believe the gospel or not, my debts are paid for if Jesus died for me. And they, the problem with penal substitution is that it works out real good whenever people are pious towards God. But as successive generations have passed on, and now we're in a backslidden generation, the very doctrines that penal substitution upholds is now the best excuse for unrepentance in wicked men. And that's not just the unbeliever's depraved mind making a mistake. They're taking penal substitution to its logical conclusions. And that's something a lot of Christians won't ever do. They won't think through their theology or their belief system enough to look at what the conclusion of their belief system leads to. And I think that's why so many people set in error in our churches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also um, the whole thing about the sin debt already being paid for. Um, there's no way that the reformed uh, theologians can, can use Colossians uh, chapter two to say that because then why would it say in acts three nineteen repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. If they're already, blotted out if that's what the handwriting of ordinance is that blotted out the sin debt then acts 319 wouldn't say that you have to repent and be saved before that can take place 
Right. You know, that's what I ask people a question. If you want to get to really quick to understanding someone's atonement view, ask them this question. When was your sin debt blotted out? At Calvary or when you repent? And based off how they answer that question, will tell you everything you need to know about their atonement view or the lack thereof. Uh, most people will tell you at the cross, and that's not what the Bible says. It says, as you mentioned in Acts 3.19, that your sin debt is blotted out whenever you repent and believe the gospel. And mind you, as Romans 3.24 says, for the sins that are past, it doesn't say anything about your future sinning because we yeah. know you can recur a debt in, according to, you know, Hebrews says you can fall away from the faith and, and receive sore punishment, even having been quickened by the Spirit and all these things. Just like the unforgiving servant parable, the servant's debt's forgiven and then reinstated whenever he doesn't uh, keep his side of the deal, whenever he doesn't walk out in humble obedience, uh, having been delivered by the king, having been forgiven his trespasses, the trespasses are reinstated on him. So that's interesting. And Jesus says, this is how the kingdom of heaven is. So again, that refutes the reformed view that refutes penal substitution very soundly that uh, if your sin debt is blotted out when you repent, then that must not been the operation of the, that must not been the nature of the atonement of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. And uh, I just want to mention one more point here. And then uh, I was going to um, go into another uh, topic here, but uh, in verse 13 of Colossians 2, I've also heard people say uh, they, they use this verse where it says that he has forgiven you all trespasses. And they try to use that verse to say that all your sins, past, present, and future, have already been forgiven. Um, but like this, the things that you just said really refute that, and also the fact that um, uh, you know your future sins are not. They, they don't exist yet. You know, that's a, a future contingency. You know, the Bible clearly it talks about that in many places, how, you know, I set before you life and death, choose to stay life. You know, there's a, there's a choice. There's different paths to, to go down. It's not like it's all, you know, written in stone. Yeah, well, so, the problem uh, is, brother, our time in human history, as me and you have mentioned throughout our last two videos in this series on the atonement, is that Gnosticism, which is rooted in Manichaeanism and Platonic pagan philosophy, their view is, is that the future does already exist in, a, in sort of an existential reality. And so God already exists in the future. You know, our future sins, he already sees them. They're already occurring in his mind. And so those were on his mind to address those sin debts, which had not yet been committed in the actual world for the elect when Jesus died. So, of course, you know, the entire Calvinist system is built one principle on another, but all of its root is founded in Platonic, Gnostic, and pagan concepts and philosophies. So a lot of times the Reformed theologian or the penal substitutionist, they'll accuse us free will holiness believers of being philo philosophical, but uh, the philosophers are the ones that are determinists. The philosophers are the ones that deny free will. The philosophers and the pagans, they're the ones that teach that nature is sinful and the physical world is sinful, that, that uh, the future already exists, that God is this eternal now dwelling in the past, present, and future. That literally came from Plato as a, as a pagan philosopher. That's nowhere ever stated in the Bible. That's amazing to me that people build their entire theological system on literally pagan philosophers and they have no scriptural backing for their views whatsoever. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's very crazy. Um, I just want to uh, move into um, talking about verse 15 at this point. And uh, verse 15 says, um, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. And so, um, it was what Jesus did on the cross um, that caused him to uh, defeat the devil. You know, uh, the devil, he, um, he thought that he was going to have the victory. You know, the verse where it talks about how uh, Jesus said, this is your hour and the power of darkness. It also says, um, 
that uh, if, if they had not known uh, what they were doing, they wouldn't have uh, crucified the Lord of glory. Um, and in uh, Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 13 and 14, it says that Jesus has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And so uh, that's another part of, of the atonement is um, that just as Adam, um, he gave up his authority that God had given him at the Garden of Eden. And so the devil was able to take that authority from mankind. And uh, through the atonement, Christ has defeated the the powers and principalities defeated the devil and um, and we he set the captives free and he translated us out of the the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son and so uh, i'm just going to go through some verses here hopefully it doesn't take too long to uh get through this but um a lot of uh, what the devil um the, the power that the devil has it's all it all started you know when man first fell and uh, even still today, a lot of uh, the devil's power comes from uh, comes from sin. And um, so it talks about uh, in Genesis um, when man was given, he was given authority over the the garden, over the earth. And uh, it says in in uh, Genesis chapter two, verse fifteen to seventeen, God told Adam to dress the garden and to keep it. So, you know, the word dress means to, to work in the garden, to, to, um, uh, you know, do all the, all the things that, that he did to, um, uh, grow the food and all that. And then the word keep is the Hebrew word, um, shamar, which means to, uh, to guard it, to protect it. And so, you know, he had already, um, wasn't doing his job well when he allowed the serpent to come in and um and then because he um he believed the lie of the devil him and his wife um he uh he gave up the authority that god had given him uh to the devil and the bible talks about how the devil is the prince of this world it says that in um in the gospel of john uh john 12 31 john 14 30 and John 16, 11, and uh, also in Ephesians um, 2, verse 2, it says that um, that he's the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. And uh, in Luke 4, 6, <clears throat> uh, the devil said to Jesus when he was being tempted in the wilderness, he said, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them for that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever will I, I will give it. <clears throat> and so um, God already had a plan after man fell to um, to restore this authority to um, to man that the devil had stolen. And it was it was going to be through Christ. And that's why it says in uh, Genesis 315, he says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed right and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel so the devil was completely uh defeated um his his head was was crushed but the um you know and and christ you know he he had to suffer and his his heel was bruised but he ultimately gained the victory and uh in hebrews chapter 2 verse 15, 14 and 15 it says that um, that the devil had um, the power of death. And uh, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And so um, it was because because of sin, everyone who who's uh, committed sin, the devil has the ability to, um, you know, uh, 
he, he has the power of, of death, hell, and the grave. And uh, it was because Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life that he was able to conquer the grave. It says this in Romans 1, 4. It says that uh, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And um, uh, a lot of people think that, um, you know, when Jesus died, he was in the, the belly of the earth. Uh, three days and three nights. It says in the English Bible that he went to hell. It, uh, David prophesied that this would happen in uh, Psalm 16:10. He says, "For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption." Um, but in the in the Greek and the Hebrew, um, in, in the Greek there's the word Hades, which uh, it it talks about that in. Um, in Luke chapter 16, the parable of uh, the rich man and Lazarus, you know, they both died. Um, the rich man went to the place of torment. Uh, Lazarus, he went to Abraham's bosom. And so um, when Jesus died, he went to both places. He went to um, he went to hell and he, he didn't suffer in hell. There's no scripture anywhere in the Bible where it says that he suffered in hell or that he burned in hell. Which is a common teaching today. Yeah. Some people will actually teach that that was part of the atonement. And, you know, we know that, as it says in John 19, 30, um, that Jesus said um, right before he died, it is finished, meaning that his work of the atonement was finished at that point. But some will try to say that he became some type of burnt offering in hell or something ridiculous like that, or that he was tortured by the devil or. I heard Joyce Myers teach that. Um, also, Stephen Anderson, that guy's. I believe Paula old. White holds to a view of that as well. Hmm. Wouldn't surprise me. Me neither. Um, and so in Revelation 118, it says um, that Jesus took the, the keys of, of death and hell. And um, it, it's interesting how. Um, uh, when he went to Abraham's bosom, that's where all of the Old Testament saints were. And in Matthew uh, 27, verse 52 and 53, it says, uh, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. And uh, I got a quote here from uh, Jack Hayford. And uh, he says, with reference that he descended into hell, there is no biblical support for the notion that Jesus suffered in hell, only that he descended to Sheol to release the righteous dead into eternal glory, proclaiming the adequacy of the atonement and validating the testimony of the prophets. So, you know, all the, the Old Testament saints, they had to, to keep the Old Testament law. They had to keep the sacrifices and stuff as a temporary forgiveness for their sins and uh, in order to preserve them so they could go to Abraham's bosom. And then when Jesus came there, you know, he was the, um, he was the Messiah that they were looking forward to. You know, nowadays we look backwards in time to the Messiah, but they were awaiting his, his coming. And so uh, in a certain sense, they're saved. They were saved by faith in the Messiah, just as we are today. Um, then it, in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, it says, um, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Um, and so then uh, in... Matthew 28, after Jesus is uh, resurrected, he's, he's uh, conquered um, death, hell, and the grave. He's, he's stolen that authority or took that authority back from the devil. Amen, and yes. he, he gives it uh, to believers. Um, he says, uh, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. 
uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Right. Um, it's interesting, though, how the uh, King James Version, everywhere where the, the Greek word exousia is used in the Greek New Testament, it translates it as power. Right. But it really should be translated authority because right. um, like some Christians believe that uh, that the devil has no more power, that he can't attack us at all anymore, but that's not true. Um, we have authority to overcome him if we know how to use it, if we stand in that authority. Um, but we can't just, you know, sit back and say, oh, the devil can't do anything to me anymore because it says that he still um, walks about uh, as a roaring lion. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. He seeking whom he may devour. So, Man, yeah, you know, if you don't know how to use that authority, then then how are you going to, um, you know, overcome the, the devil? And uh, w we see that with um, the seven sons of Sceva. You know, they, they knew that there's power and authority in the name of Jesus. Uh, but the reason that it didn't work for them is because they weren't submitted to that authority themselves. They didn't have a personal relationship with Christ themselves. They weren't, you know, they weren't keeping his commandments. They weren't truly walking with him. So w if you try to use that authority over demonic spirits, then they're just going to be like, well, you're not under that authority so why do we have to listen to you and uh, so in order for us to stand in this authority that we've been given by Christ um, and for the, the devil not to be able to attack us um, a big part of that is not living in sin and uh, it talks about this in uh in Romans, um, what, where is it? Romans uh, 13, 14, it says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. And so that's what we must do. Just, just as Jesus said in John 14, 30, that uh, um, the prince of this world comes, but he has nothing in me. And so if we're, not, if we're living in a way that uh, there isn't any area of our lives where we're giving place to the devil, or where we're giving place to the flesh, then, you know, there's, there's nothing he can really do to attack us. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, really, um, what we got to do in order to stand in our authority in Christ. And, uh, you know, he said in, in Matthew 16, um, that, uh, on this rock will I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Right. And he said, uh, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And uh, so just like, uh, just like Paul in the book of Acts, you know, we have the ability to, to um, cast out devils um, and, uh, also healing the sick, raising the dead, um, you know, miracles, signs and wonders. I believe in all those things, you know, that's part of our authority in Christ. And that's actually part of preaching the full gospel. Um, cause Paul talked about that in Romans, I think it was chapter 15 or chapter 16. He said, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ with mighty signs and wonders. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we just need to, uh, stand in our authority. And there is one, uh, one quote that I wanted to uh, read from uh, Rick Renner. This is from the book uh, Living in the Combat Zone. He talks about uh, Colossians 2.15. He explains it quite well. He says, um, the phrase triumphing over them in it is the key to this verse. This phrase is from the Greek word triambu which is a technical word used to describe a general or an emperor who was returning home from a, gen from a grand victory in the enemy's territory. The word triumph, triumbu, was a specific word used to describe this emperor's triumphal parade.
When news reached the city that the enemy had been defeated, plans for a triumphal parade immediately went into action. By the time the gates of the city were opened wide to receive this emperor who was now returning home in triumph, his people were ready to celebrate his victory. As the gates swung open and this mighty warrior rode through, the celebration began. Sitting astride a large, beautiful white stallion draped in his kingly, regal garments and wearing his bright and shining royal crown upon his head, the returning emperor led the entire city in a procession of celebration and victory. It was called his triumphal parade. As he rode down the main avenue of the city with his head held high, his shoulders thrown back and a look of victory on his face, the city began rejoicing. He's back, he's back. Our king has won a massive victory. People would break into dancing, singing, and jubilantly hurling themselves in circles. This was a time to rejoice. In order to flaunt his great victory, the returning victor would parade him, the foreign king, taken in captivity. There, behind the victor, walked a defeated foe bound in heavy chains of bondage. Behind this defunct foe walked the defeated king's ruling men and leaders, now bound and chained along with their ruined king. Further back behind them were ox carts loaded to overflowing with booty taken by force from the enemy's homeland. Once these goods had belonged to the enemy, but now they belonged to the conquering king. As the returning victorious emperor rode down the avenue, he strutted with pride, flaunting his defeated foes and made a show of them openly. He wanted everyone to see the fabulous goods he had stolen from his enemy's hand. The enemy had been completely spoiled. But it doesn't stop here. The entire celebration began when the emperor sang a song of victory. As he rode that horse through the gate, leading his triumphal parade, he would open his mouth and sing as loud as he, he could sing. With all of his might, he would sing, The enemy is defeated. The foe is conquered. Let it be known that I am still king. This song would throw the crowd into a frenzy. This was the voice, and this was the song they were waiting for. The king had returned, and he was still king. Then, after riding down the main avenue, revealing his booty and singing his song of victory, the victor uh, stopped in front of a large set of stairs which led upward to a huge, ornate throne. His military conquest proved that he was still the holder of authority. Therefore, he proudly walked up those steps, turned toward the crowd, and lowered himself down into the seat, sitting in his rightful place, the throne. All of this is the background to Colossians 2.15, which says, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. This was the joy that was set before him. Once death, hell, and the grave were conquered, Jesus returned home to heaven where a celebrative triumphal parade took place. Who led the parade? The victor, Jesus Christ. What song did he sing? Perhaps it went something like this. I've defeated the enemy. Death, death no longer has a hold on men. Satan is completely conquered. And let it be known, I am still king. Imagine the worship, praise, and adoration that took place the day that Jesus, our reigning king, returned home to glory to sit down at the Father's right hand. Amen. That's what you're saying there in Colossians 2.15, that he's, part of his atoning work was to spoil the principalities and powers and make a show of them open, openly, triumphing over them in it and the it can be understood from the verse before it his cross so that's how he triumphed over them and displayed his triumphing over them as well as spoiling them and spoiling them in what way by taking their spoils and releasing us as captives you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so uh that's part again like you mentioned last week in our last study that part and parcel of the atoning work of Christ is to liberate us from sin. And uh, that's something that penal substitution, brother, it lacks. It doesn't talk at all about getting you out of sin. It's all about covering you and saving you in your sins. And so that's a damnable gospel. Penal substitution misses the point of Jesus spoiling the principalities and powers. It doesn't, they make it look like God needs spoiled. You know, we were owed a debt to God. Jesus paid God off. Now we're free and Jesus spoiled. God spoils. You know, God had us under his wrathful obligation. He was the angry banker and we were the debtors. 
and Jesus spoiled God's um, bank accounts by liberating us by paying for us. That's not the biblical narrative. We were spoiled. Jesus spoiled the principalities and powers of evil and darkness on the cross in liberating us. As you quoted from Colossians 1, um, you know, redeeming us through his blood, delivering us from the power of darkness, Colossians 1.13, and translating us in the kingdom of his dear son. So that's the, that's the point of the atonement uh, to create of this new kingdom, as I mentioned earlier, both Jew and Gentile through the cross, having blotted out the ordinances that separated Jew and Gentile, as well as redeeming us from the power of darkness, be it Jew and Gentile, because both of us were in darkness, as Paul taught in Romans chapter 2 and 3, that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, whether you were a Jew or a Gentile, and we were as slaves of darkness and selfishness. And through the atoning work of Jesus, he's liberated us, uh, made possible, should I say, our liberation, uh, spoiling the principalities and powers that had us in chains. And mm. so, uh, again, you never hear nothing about that in penal substitution. The theologians, uh, it's all about trying to save us from God uh, when God was trying to save us from the ruin of our sin and, uh, and, and still maintain his righteous government all at the same time, Romans 3, 24 to 26. And as you just mentioned with the king and his spoiling principalities and powers in his kingdom. So praise God, brother. This is really coming together. This has been a really a good study. Yeah, for sure. Um, and what you said about how penal substitution doesn't teach anything about saving us from sin, that just uh, kind of made me think of a couple really good verses. Um, uh, 1 John 3, 5, you know, it says uh, he was manifested, uh, Jesus, to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. And then also uh, 1 John 3, 8, um, he that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. And for this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen. So. Absolutely. I would say that People who teach penal substitution will always probably mention that we need to live holy. And, you know, they'll, the same people who teach penal substitution will usually also teach a progressive sanctification that over time you get out of different sins that you're committing. And so I'm not saying that they don't teach at all that um, you need to live right. But the problem is when you look at penal substitution theory in its box, as a view of the atonement of Jesus, it does not contain in its view of the atonement anything, as far as I know, that relates to liberating, liberating us from sin. That's another doctrine altogether for the Reformed believer. They separate freedom from sin from the atonement of Christ because they do not view the atonement of Christ as being in its purpose to liberate us from sin. They view it as us being liberated from our legal sin debt, which we were bound to at God's wrathful hand. So they don't have any, anything within their view of the atonement that talks about liberating us from the practice and sway of sin. Now, of course, you're going to have people who teach penal substitution mixed with about 30 other theories of the atonement, and they'll talk out both sides of their mouth the entire time. But if, if you look at the doctrine by itself, period, penal substitution on its own, without mixing it with any other theological doctrine, then you will find that it neglects so much that the Bible says that the atonement of Jesus contained. Yeah, amen. Um, and the Bible talks about this again, um, how the atonement is, um, it gives us an example um, or it sets us free from sin um, in first Peter chapter 2 uh, verse 24 you know we, we talked about this before how it's it doesn't it's not really as literal as it sounds and it says uh, who is who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree but I like the last part of the verse where it says that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed Amen. You know, it just makes sense that Jesus' atoning work made possible our healing, and in doing so, along with the moral influence of his cross in, in reconciling our hearts back to himself, that we've been healed by that, and therefore we should live in unto righteousness um, now that we're God's.
and we've been bought with a price, the high blood of the blood of Jesus, the high cost, the high price of the blood of Jesus being given on that behalf of sinful men as a, as a substitute for the penalty so that the penalty of hell could be canceled, not executed on him, which again is 100% Bible. And that's why I find it so grieving sometimes when people misunderstand the governmental view of the atonement, or they don't even study it, or they just do a quick Google search, a click, 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 click. Oh yeah, five articles from Reformed preachers on why the governmental view is heretical. And they do absolutely zero research themselves. They don't think through their Bible. They don't even listen to the arguments being made on their side or our side. And therefore, because penal substitution it holds the majority view at this time in the Western church, they just go with the majority. And I love a quote by Dennis Carroll, and I'll, I'll be finished in my personal opinions for tonight at this point with this quote. But I love this quote. Be a lover of truth. Let neither the majority nor authority be more important to you than truth. Dennis Carroll. Neither let the majority opinion nor the claims of authority by men be the reason you believe one doctrine or another when it comes to your Christian walk. You have to be willing to seek God yourself and study your Bible and try to get to, by prayer and fasting as well, a true understanding of things if you so wish to do so. And uh, I'm afraid a lot of people, it's so much easier to just go to Bible college or whatever. I'm not saying Bible college is wrong, but I think a lot of preachers that do go through Bible college, they're not apt to really understand doctrines on their own. They're very dependent on just being told what to believe. And then they graduate from their comfortable Bible college and they're given a comfortable pulpit with a handsome pay or at least a comfortable pay. And they're happy with preaching penal substitution, whether it's right or wrong, uh, because, hey, everybody else believes penal substitution or my favorite preacher from the past believed penal substitution. So that's what I'm going to believe. If it was good enough for them, it's good enough for me. And uh, they think me and you, brother, I was told me and you are kicking a dead horse. And I don't think that this horse is dead enough because penal substitution is still alive. So as far as I'm considered or uh, as far as I'm convinced, it needs kicked more because it's not dead in the church. A penal substitution is the root today of antinomianism and lawlessness in Christian, Christianity in America, and, uh, and it needs killed. And uh, so I pray by these videos, we would kill this horse that's not dead, and uh, that horse is false doctrine of penal substitution. Amen. Yeah, you know what you were saying about how people just uh, believe whatever is the authority, that's really how a lot of people um, believe because they'll believe, you know, the preacher who has the most degrees or the, the preacher who has the most experience, who's been, you know, preaching or teaching the Bible the longest, or, um, you know, they'll believe what this seminary says or what this Christian author says. But there's uh, several verses in the Bible that say, um, you know, let no man deceive you, like First John 3, 7. Uh, my little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even also as he is righteous. So, um, you know, we have to be careful that uh, we believe the Bible and, and not let, uh, you know, not be persuaded by the opinions of men, just like you said. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, it was a great video. Um, thanks for watching, everyone. And uh, if you were blessed by the video, then please uh, like it and subscribe to my channel, and uh, share the videos on social media. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Check out Public Proclaimer. I'll have this posted there as well. God bless you guys, and continue following our series. We have two videos we've already posted on both of our channels, uh, Public Proclaimer YouTube, as well as, uh, what is your, say your YouTube channel, brother? True Gospel Radio. True Gospel Radio. So go to True Gospel Radio and Public Proclaimer, either one and backtrack and watch our former atonement videos it will get you up to date to where we are and i believe we may also be planning to release another few videos that might be interrelated with this topic of comparing the two governmental uh, two atonement views more government penal substitution so thank you for joining us god bless you guys god bless god bless you brother